of the Solar City with Michelle Nichols. Tonight, we are taking an armchair tour of the solar system with Michelle Nichols. Michelle is Director of Public Observing at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Physics and Astronomy from University of Illinois at uh, Champaign-Urbana, and also a Master's degree in Curriculum and Instruction from National Lewis University. Ms. Nichols leads all of Adler Planetarium's telescope, observatory, and public sky observing initiatives and events. And before landing at Adler, Michelle worked in Florida at, at the US Space Camp in the Astronaut Memorial Planetarium, as well as the planetarium in Champaign. So let's give a warm welcome to Michelle Nichols. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Um, Hi, everybody. I know you're out there. Um, can't see you or hear you, but definitely if you have questions or comments, please go ahead and share those with us throughout the program tonight. Um, questions in the Q&A, comments in the chat. Um, you don't have to wait to the end, <clears throat> excuse me, to put a question into the Q&A. We will get to the questions at the end, um, but as you think of one, go ahead and put that into the Q&A. I'd love to see your questions. Um, it's been an exciting week, to say the least, in, uh, in astronomy. Um, you probably saw <clears throat> the James Webb Space Telescope images from the other day. They just released um, a few more images today, not the, not the incredibly pretty ones from, uh, from a few days ago, but these were images that were taken um, while they were checking out the telescope and making sure that everything was working. And I did put uh, one of those images into my talk because it is an image of Jupiter, which is uh, pretty cool. So you'd be able to see what Jupiter looks like in infrared. So um, uh, it's, it's just so exciting that we now have this amazing tool that is out there uh, in space gathering data about nearby stuff in our solar system and far away things in the universe. So I uh, hope we get to talk more about that in the future. All right, let's get going. This is armchair tour of the universe and, or excuse me, of the solar system. And um, this is one of my favorite talks because we get to just let all the pretty pictures go by. And um, I, Every time I do this talk, I add a few, I take out a few, mix it up a little bit. Um, but you'll hear some common themes throughout this presentation. Um, and you'll, you'll see that uh, processes that we have going on here on Earth, they happen elsewhere in the solar system as well. And um, why don't we dive right in and get going with a program. 99% of our solar system is the sun. Not 99% of the space, 99% of the stuff. Actually, it's more than 99%. If you take all the mass of all the planets, and moons and asteroids and comets, and you add that all up, it, that doesn't even equal 1% of the amount of stuff that's in our sun. Our sun is the reason we're here. Uh, our sun provides the light and heat that we need to thrive. And what we have is the sun to scale with uh, planets in our solar system. We'll get back to the planets in just a bit, but I want to show you a little bit about the sun. Um, the, our sun is something that is familiar and yet still uh, in some cases unknown to us. Uh, our sun goes through cycles of activity. Our sun uh, has these dark spots appear from time to time. This is actually a screenshot of what the sun looks like today. And yes, those are numbers. Uh, scientists number the sunspots. I'll get to what sunspots are in just a second. Um, but our sun goes through cycles of activity where you might see more of these sunspots. You might see fewer of these sunspots. Um, there's other kinds of activity that our, that our sun has as well. This is a, a, a photograph of what the sun looked like a few days ago. This is in um, a different color of light than from what the what the previous image was taken in, but you get to see a lot more features and detail. You get to see some of these sunspots. These are cooler areas that are uh, that are in the in the top layer of, of the sun, and these parts right here are are plumes of gas that are gently wafting off the uh, off the surface of the sun. We call those filaments. And over here near the edge, we have these gentle plumes, we call those prominences. And these are 
uh, types of activity that we see on the sun from time to time. Now I mentioned the sun goes through a cycle of activity about, it, it's about 11 years long, meaning uh, at one point we'll see lots of sunspots and other activity. And then maybe five or six years later, we see a lull uh, of activity. And then we go back up to uh, a high point of activity. And this is a, a fairly constant cycle that we've seen for quite a long time. And these are one of those sunspots. A sunspot is an area that's a little cooler than the rest of the sun. That's why it appears dark. And notice the size to scale with the United States um, for this particular sunspot. It's about the size of Earth. And that's a pretty typical size for a sunspot. Sometimes they can even appear a bit bigger. Sometimes we've even seen them as big as the planet Jupiter, um, which is quite a large sunspot. Now, our sun has other types of activity. This is called a solar flare. And that's when the sun uh, spits off um, some, some energy, a little burst of energy. And so you can see that in this particular series of images right here. Sometimes the sun has a bigger burst of uh, energy and material. We call this a coronal mass ejection. This one was almost exactly, oops, sorry, almost exactly 10 years ago. And what you see is a burst of material and energy coming from the sun. And then that white stuff that you see all throughout this, these images is radiation that was overwhelming the detectors for these particular cameras, these spacecraft that took these images. This was a really, really large burst of energy and material. Now I mentioned that our sun goes through these cycles um, and we are ramping up to a, a high point of a cycle in the next couple of years, maybe not, about the next two or three years. Um, and then we will go back down to, a, to a, a, a lull in that activity as well. Now I mentioned that our sun is known and yet unknown. Um, it's still difficult for us to predict exactly when these flares or these coronal mass ejections will occur. These are bursts of energy that can have effects here on Earth as well. Um, so it's very important that we study the sun and keep studying the sun because it's our neighbor star. And again, like I said before, it's the reason. Now getting to the planets, everybody loves pictures of the planets. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you pictures of planets and a few moons, asteroids, comets. I can't show you everything in the solar system because we would be here until next week if we did that. Um, so I had to pick and choose some of my favorite images. We're gonna go outward from the sun, <coughs> starting with the planet Mercury. So let's get going with the closest planet to the sun. Now, Mercury looks a lot like our moon. Um, it is covered in craters. There's no atmosphere here. Um, Mercury is, has been pummeled by stuff over its entire history. Um, and you can see that reflected in all the differently sized craters that you see on the surface. But not every hole that you see here on the surface is due to uh, the surface being hit by something from space. So uh, the way a crater is usually made, something from space smashes into a surface, stuff splashes out, makes a hole. That's a crater. Um, the size of the crater can depend on the speed of the thing that hit it or the size of the thing that hit or the angle. <clears throat> a few times though, we've got a different kind of crater. This is a different crater. This is a volcanic crater. Um, Mercury had volcanoes. It stopped being volcanically active about three and a half billion years ago. Um, but this is a part of uh, Mercury where uh, we had molten rock coming out of the surface and, and going out onto the surface. And we can see that here in this picture right here. What you see is lots of craters, but some of these areas look a bit smoother. And this is where uh, the, the surface had been, um, uh, lava came out and, and flowed out onto the surface of the planet and, and kind of filled in some of these uh, craters. So you can see the, the smoother areas are from that. And then that stuff solidified. And then it got hit by more things from space. And you can see some of the smaller craters uh, in and among there as well. So 
something that we are familiar with here on Earth is definitely volcanoes, and volcanoes occur in other places in our solar system as well. But the story of Mercury is not just the story of fire, it's the story of ice, believe it or not. Now, Mercury is the closest planet to the sun. The side of Mercury that, that faces the sun is at a roasting about 800 degrees Fahrenheit. The side that faces away from the sun is at about 200 degrees below zero. Mercury rotates very slowly. Think of it as uh, the planet is being slowly rotisserie. But there are some of the craters near the poles, so near the north and south pole of Mercury, where the sun just doesn't get high enough in the sky. If you were standing on the floor of this crater, it would be so deep, the sun wouldn't get high enough in your sky that you would be able to see it. And so these, these craters are permanently in shadow on their floors. So as ice collects, so maybe, maybe a comet hits the planet and, and ice collects in some of these craters and ice can form in various ways. The ice doesn't go anywhere. It just sits in these permanently shadowed craters where you see colored here in yellow is where we've seen water ice, the same stuff that's in your freezer. Um, we've seen this in these shadowed craters on the planet Mercury, which is pretty amazing to think about. The same stuff you have in your freezer, we find elsewhere in the solar system. Now going out from the sun, the planet Venus, if you wanna talk about another planet, which is a slow rotisserie, that is Venus. Now Venus differs from Mercury, it's bigger, and it is completely covered by an atmosphere and clouds. And these clouds trap the heat from the sun. So that even though Venus is farther from the sun than Mercury, the clouds trap, the clouds and the, and the atmosphere trap the heat. And so Venus's surface temperature is an absolutely roasting, almost 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, if we want to see what's below these clouds, we have to use radar and other means to be able to do that. We can't, we can't see through the clouds, um, but we've been able to do this. We, and we can take some altitude measurements. And this area right here in the middle of the picture is called beta ratio. And this is a volcanic rise. So Venus is covered in thousands of volcanoes. We think some of them may still be active. We don't know for sure. But uh, some, some NASA spacecraft in the next few years uh, that will launch by the end of this decade may tell us if, may be able to tell us if, uh, if Venus's volcanoes are still actually active. Uh, but this area right here was created as volcanoes um, erupted and, and material pushed up from below. In Ma'at Montes is this particular mountain right here. This is the tallest volcano on Venus. And you can see where uh, we've got some cracks in the surface and this goes over to this particular part of Venus, which is called Aphrodite Terra. Um, now, Venus has high points, low points, um, but the surface, people want to know, what does the surface look like? If these are far away images, I want to see a close-up image, right? So in the 1970s and 80s, there were Soviet uh, spacecraft called Venera. And they were able to successfully land a handful of these space spacecraft on the surface of Venus and take some pictures. This is uh, one of those pictures. And... If any of you may have ever been to a volcano national park in Hawaii, or uh, you visited a volcano, or you've seen imagery of volcanic rock, that's exactly what this looks like. So um, the, you can see the portion of the spacecraft right here, and uh, you can see the rocks beyond. Venus is, is covered in volcanic rock. Here's another image right here. If you were on the surface of Venus, the uh, air pressure would be crushing you. The clouds are made of sulfuric acid. The air temperature is almost 900 degrees. It would be about as bright as an overcast cloudy day here on Earth. So it gives you a sense of what it's like to be on the surface of this amazing world. So we're gonna learn more about Venus in the next few years, like I said, with those uh, NASA spacecraft. I'm not gonna spend much time on Earth and our moon, but there's two things I want to point out. Please think of this image as you see everything else I'm gonna show you in the solar system. 
there is no other planet in our solar system quite like Earth. Um, the blue is liquid water. The white is water vapor and water ice. Um, we've got an amazing abundance of water here. We're not the only place in the solar system that has water, but we have the only place in the solar system that has uh, liquid water on the surface of our world. We're at the right temperature, we're at the right distance from the sun. Our planet is habitable. And there's no other place in the solar system that is immediately habitable for people. So please remember this when you see the unmistakable blue of water and green of life on our planet that there really is no planet B for us in the solar system. We can't just pick up and go to someplace else and uh, if, we, if we mess things up here. Um, and so take a look at our moon in the foreground in this image. <coughs> and you can see our moon looks quite dry and, and desolate. Um, you can see the, the planet Earth beyond. But our moon is not totally dry and desolate when we take a look at the South Pole and the North Pole of our moon, just like on Mercury, there are some shadowed craters, just like on Mercury, ice has collected in some of those shadowed craters. And everything that's marked in blue here in this picture is where we found ice. And this ice is confirmed. We know it's there. Um, it's, it's really neat to think that when you look up at the moon in the sky, at the, at the North and South Poles of our moon, we have something that Again, you have in your freezer. So think about that next time you look at the moon and, and the night sky. Going a little further out, the story of Mars currently is ice, but in the past, it, it was water. In the past, Mars also had uh, volcanoes. You can see some of the volcanoes, these, these uh, splotches here on the left-hand side of the planet in this particular image. Mars has evidence of, of a number of volcanoes. Some are big, some are small, and uh, none of them are, are active as far as we know. Um, but the story of Mars is also fire and ice. It used to be volcanically active. It is currently a frozen desert. But in the past, water was the story of Mars. And we see the evidence of this water. Uh, the more we look, the more we, evidence we find. You don't have to know too much about geology to be able to take a look at this picture and go, wow, that sure looks like a dried up riverbed, doesn't it? And that's exactly what scientists started seeing when we started taking imagery of the surface of Mars um, several decades ago when we first started uh, sending spacecraft into orbit around Mars, starting with Mariner 9 in the early 1970s. When we started landing our spacecraft on Mars, we found other evidence of ice and other evidence of past liquid water on Mars. This is uh, evidence of ice. This was taken by the Mars Phoenix spacecraft um, close to 15 years ago. But the shapes that you see, so you look at the, at the ground, if you notice there's these little shapes. They look like polygons. Um, it's, it's ice under the surface that creates those shapes. As the ice expands and contracts, it causes the ground above to, to, to form those shapes. So we knew there was ice below the surface here. But Mars Phoenix could actually do one, one better. It has scoop on it. And they took the scoop and scooped down into, the, into that dust. And about two inches below the surface, we found ice. And if you take a look at these pictures, we have little chips that appeared in this picture here, and those chips are gone about four days later. Um, by the way, if you see the word sol, that just refers to a Martian day. A Martian day is slightly longer than an Earth day. Um, and so when you see the word sol, that's, that's referring to a Martian day. Anyway, the um, ice that was exposed to the air vaporized. Uh, over the course of a few days. And so that's why you see it in this little trench right here and you don't see it a few days later. So there is a lot of ice on and under the surface. If you melt all the ice that we know exists on Mars, you can cover the entire planet with a layer of water 115 feet thick. That's quite a lot of water. 
But we want to know about water that existed in the past. We saw that dried up river. Is there any other evidence that Mars used to be a lot wetter than it is now? The answer is yes. We found minerals that suggest that water was involved in concentrating them. This whitish colored stuff is called silica. Um, it's in such a high concentration in this particular sample that you're looking at right here that scientists think that this is evidence that hot springs used to exist, hot minerally water used to exist in this particular part of Mars. This one, this lighter colored mineral right here is called calcium sulfate. You may not know calcium sulfate by that name, but you may know it by another name, which is gypsum. You may know it by another name, which is plaster of Paris. Um, so we have this stuff here on Earth. We have uh, silica on Earth as well. And the only way that we know of that you can concentrate silica in such a high concentration is water. And how this particular gyps or this particular uh, calcium sulfate mineral got concentrated in this in this vein right here, hot minerally water was flowing through cracks in rocks. The water uh, went and dried up and left the minerals behind. And so the vein slowly filled up over time. So this is evidence that hot minerally water flowed through this rock to create this vein of calcium sulfate. All right, so we've got dried up river, we've got hot minerally hot spring, we've got uh, hot minerally water flowing through rock, uh, cracks and rocks. How about a, a flowing freshwater stream? Um, this image on the right is a dried stream bed in Chile. What you're looking at is rounded rocks and the, and the rocks got rounded due to the action of water and they got all stuck together um, due to the minerals that are, that, are, that are there as well. The picture on the left is a dried stream on Mars. And this dried stream was last flowing probably about 3 billion years ago. So a really long time ago, but this particular stream um, we think was about knee deep and it was so clean, you could take a glass, you could walk out in the middle of the stream, dunk your glass in the, in the stream and drink the water. It was that fresh. <coughs> so flowing water streams on Mars. Now we're gonna get to my favorite solar system image, my, my currently favorite solar system image. And it's this one right here. And you're, and you're looking at it, I'm sure you're looking at it thinking, wow, Michelle must be weird if, she, if, if this rock is her favorite image. Imagine, if you will, ponds dotting the floor of a hundred mile wide crater. Over time, streams filled up the ponds, the ponds dried and they filled and they dried and they filled. And this happened probably repeatedly. Well. The ponds dried up for the final time and left dried mud behind. Over time, the dried mud turned into rock. And that's what you're looking at here. This is a rock that about 3 billion years ago was ancient dried mud on Mars. You're looking at the last time that this particular spot on Mars had liquid water flowing over it. Mars used to have a thicker atmosphere. It used to be a little bit warmer. And over time, Mars lost a lot of its air to space. And that means the liquid water couldn't stay liquid any longer. And it seeped down below the surface and it boiled away into space. Um, and, and so uh, Mars can't hold liquid water on the surface today, but you're seeing evidence that it definitely did in the past. This is a portion of uh, the crater where the Perseverance rover is right now. Perseverance is located, I think you can see my arrow, it's located approximately right here right now. This is uh, called Jezero Crater, and you're seeing a portion of the crater, but what you're seeing is a dried river that flowed into the crater and deposited um, dust and silt and stuff into this, this river delta right here. Um, sometimes there were flash floods that moved boulders many feet in diameter. Sometimes it was a lazy river that deposited dust and silt um, in this particular spot. So what the Perseverance rover is doing is investigating the rocks 
that were altered by water over time. And we already have found evidence that yes, liquid water used to be here. Water at one point, or actually several points, filled this crater, um, which is pretty neat to think about. All right, asteroids. Asteroids, for the most part, are located between Mars and Jupiter. There are some that are elsewhere in the solar system, but the majority of them that we found are between Mars and Jupiter. Um, sorry, the majority that we've been able to find in our, in our nearby part of the solar system are between Mars and Jupiter. Um, many hundred thousand asteroids that we found. The, the story of asteroids is rock and metal. And in some cases, ice. Uh, asteroids are leftovers from the formation of our solar system. This is the largest one. It's called Ceres. It's the only round asteroid. How something gets round in the solar system is you have to have enough mass and therefore enough gravity to then pull you into a round shape. If you don't have enough mass, you're gonna be lumpy. And so Ceres is the only asteroid that's big enough and massive enough to have enough gravity to pull that rock into a round shape. But Ceres is not totally made of rock. Everywhere that you see colored blue is ice that has been found under the surface of the asteroid Ceres. We know it's there. Ceres even has evidence that it had, it had volcanic activity in the past, but not from hot liquid rock. It's from ice, ice volcanoes. And so we see ice volcanoes elsewhere in the solar system too. Vesta is one of the larger, one of the largest asteroids, but not quite big enough to pull itself into a round shape. But we've been able to study uh, Vesta up close and, and Ceres as well. But there are a few others and I just wanna breeze through a few of these just to show you some of these um, oddball potato shaped looking uh, asteroids that we find in between Mars and Jupiter. So this is Ida and Dactyl. Dactyl is a tiny moon of Ida. Moons are not just for planets. A moon is just a satellite. Moon is just something that goes around something else. And so asteroids can have moons as well. This is Lutetia. Again, kind of lumpy. This is Itakawa. And Itakawa is a barely held together rubble pile. Um, we've seen other asteroids that are rubble piles as well. This one is called Rugu, and it is also a rubble pile. And, and you just have to take a look at it and go, yep, that looks like a pile of rubble. Um, this is asteroid Bennu. Um, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft from NASA got some samples of this asteroid and the spacecraft is on its way back to Earth and will return in about a year. And if you take a look up close, um, you can see everywhere you look, you find uh, uh, lots and lots of rocks. They actually had a tough time finding rocks of a small enough size and a clear enough space that the spacecraft could actually capture them. Um, because again, everywhere you look is rubble, rubble, rubble. So um, the, the uh, spacecraft will return in about a year and they know they got a significant sample um, that was captured by the spacecraft. So we look forward to getting our figurative hands, not literal hands, on uh, material from this asteroid. <clears throat> Jupiter, largest planet in our solar system. Um, it's called one of the gas giants. And it's mostly a planet made of slushy liquid um, on the interior and uh, the atmosphere is the external layer. We have bands of clouds and the, the, the bands are winds going in opposite direction. The chemistry of the clouds causes the colors. The white is due to ammonia ice. The red, we're not 100% certain what the chemistry is that's going on there. There's still many mysteries of the planet Jupiter, but the planet spins so quickly that if it spun a lot more slowly, these storms would be round, kind of like hurricanes that we see on Earth. But because the planet spins so fast, it pulls those, uh, uh, those storms into bands. And so uh, we've got this giant planet 
that uh, spins in less than 10 hours. This is one of the poles of Jupiter. It doesn't really look a lot like when you look at it, look at the planet from the side, the poles look a bit different. We've got some jet streams going on here. We've got some storms bubbling up from, from below. And we've got some amazing cloud patterns. And by the way, these are all real pictures. These are not artists' renditions. <clears throat> the, um, uh, the colors have been enhanced a little bit, but these are all real features that you see. And uh, the, the chemistry of what's going on here, the circulation patterns, everything that happens, that happens here is something that scientists are still studying and trying to understand. Now, as promised, I wanted to show you a picture just released today um, from the James Webb Space Telescope. This is, again, not one of the prettiest pictures that you'll see. Um, but the fact that this is an image of Jupiter, again, this was taken, these were taken while they were making sure all the instruments work right. So they're not going to be beautiful, polished uh, images like the others were that you might have seen. But the fact that we, there are two things that, that are really interesting. The fact that we, the, the spacecraft took this, these pictures in about a minute, which is amazing. Um, and you can see right here, I think you can see my arrow. If you can't, it's off to the left on the left-hand picture. Those are Jupiter's rings. And the fact that these, are, these, these rings are visible in our infrared images is just amazing. And so um, these are uh, two separate wavelengths of light that are used that the spacecraft is able to detect. So look for much more uh, to be found um, uh, when we get more pictures of solar system objects. And yes, they will release prettier pictures than these. Um, but the fact that the, the spacecraft can take images like this in, like I said, a, a matter of minutes is uh, a real leap forward. And it's really neat to be able to study the rings of Jupiter. All the giant planets have rings, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. But Jupiter's and Uranus's rings and Neptune's rings are very thin, very dark, very dusty. And so uh, Jupiter's is actually, the rings are very hard to see uh, from Earth. You have to use an infrared telescope to be able to see them, a visible light telescope. Uh, you won't see them, they're that thin. Jupiter has fire and ice moons. Um, this is the moon Io. It is the most volcanically active world in the solar system. Earth is not the most volcanically active. This moon is. It's close enough to Jupiter that it orbits Jupiter every two days. What this means is, is Jupiter's gravity pushes and pulls or, or tugs on this planet, or sorry, on this moon, and squishes it and squishes it. And so it, it heats up on the inside. And that makes the interior molten. And the interior has to come out, and it comes out from volcanoes. The strange colors that you see are that the surface is covered in sulfur. These are sulfur volcanoes. And the different colors that you see are the different temperatures of sulfur. Now we know for certain that these volcanoes are active because they have paid us the favor of erupting while our spacecraft were actually looking. This is uh, an image from a spacecraft that, uh, that was watching EO as a volcano was erupting and spewing sulfur and other materials into space. And you can see this volcano erupting again here with a, a, a lake of molten sulfur. <coughs> so this is a really interesting world that I know that they're going to study more uh, using the, the, the web telescope. Um, planets and asteroids and comets are prime um, objects to study in infrared. Um, so can't wait to learn more about these. This is Jupiter's moon Europa, where you have fire with Io, you have ice with Europa. And this is a moon that is covered in water ice. Again, same stuff that's in your freezer with a layer of salt water below the ice. What kind of salt? Same stuff that's in your salt shaker. Um, so you've got water ice, a water ice crust and a salt water ocean down below that. Um, so it's, it's a really amazing place. And uh, there's going to be a spacecraft called the Europa Clipper that's going to head to Jupiter starting in, I think, 2023. So 
it'll launch. It's going to take a while to get there. Um, but we will learn more about Europa over the next decade or so. And definitely a lot of people's favorite planets, Saturn. Everybody loves looking at the rings. Um, and here we've got Saturn as it appeared in 2018. This is a picture of Saturn as it appeared in 2020. If I toggle back and forth between the two, you can see a few differences, right? You've got some cloud features that may have been a little harder to see in one, and they may be a little easier to see in another. You've got some storms that were visible in the north in 2018 that were gone in 2020. Saturn is covered in haze. It's not as colorful as Jupiter. The chemistry is a little bit different um, in, in uh, Saturn's atmosphere as compared to Jupiter. So that's why it'll look uh, different from, from uh, Jupiter. But the rings are the thing that gets everybody's attention. Those rings are made of, stop me if you've heard this, water, ice. Again, same stuff in your freezer. Here we've got sunlight shining through the rings and the shadow of the rings are, are cast onto the tops of the clouds of Saturn. Some of these rings are a little more dense and some are a little less dense. You can actually see through the, uh, the, uh, the shadow of the rings. You can actually see through the rings here near the bottom of the uh, image as well. Those rings, if you put them where our earth is now, if you had one side is the, uh, one edge of the rings is the Earth, the, the, our Moon would be at the other end, uh, the other side. So the rings are enormous, but they're only about thirty feet thick. So next time you're driving through Elgin or surrounding suburbs, uh, look for a three-story building, and that three-story building will be about the average thickness of Saturn's rings. You can also take a look at this image. You can see the rings. Again, you can see through some of them. Some are, some are gonna be less dense than others. You can see some of those storms that are within Saturn's atmosphere. Here we've got my, one of, uh, another one of my favorite, favorite solar system images. We've got some of the material from the rings. Uh, something else, some other small body has caused the ring material here to kind of pop upward a little bit. So sunlight is shining from the top of the picture, shining on this popped up, uh, these popped up ring bits, and you can see the shadows of that ring material on the on the lower down uh, ring material beyond. So I just showed you that these things really are three dimensional. Saturn is home to the second largest moon in our solar system, uh, Jupiter's moon Ganymede is the largest, but this one, Titan, is the second largest moon. And this is the only moon in our solar system that has an atmosphere. And you can see that here, Titan looks very hazy um, because it is covered in a hazy layer of air. <coughs> there was a spacecraft that landed uh, on the surface of Titan in 2004. And uh, this is the same image. It's just the picture on the right has been enhanced a little bit. So you can bring up some of the features. What you're seeing are essentially ice boulders. And the surface of this moon is, is very, very cold. Um, but we do see ice boulders. They're rounded, which means there is flowing liquid on the surface of this moon. But this is not liquid water. It's way too cold for that. Here is a lake of that liquid material. This is liquid ethane and liquid methane. And one of the things I wanna point out is um, that this is a radar image. Um, and so from this image, you can see uh, some rivers here. So kind of squiggly lines. These are rivers of, of liquid ethane and methane flowing into an ethane and methane lake. And this kind of bumpy feature that you see on the lake itself are waves. Titan's air moves, blows across the surface of the lake and forms waves, just like we have here uh, on planet Earth, except we have waves of water. This, these are waves of liquid ethane and methane. Pretty amazing to think about. I'm not gonna spend much time on Uranus and Neptune. Unfortunately, we don't know an awful lot about these two worlds. Uh, there's only been one spacecraft that has ever visited Uranus and Neptune, and that was Voyager 2 back in uh, 1986 and 1989. 
And so this is Uranus. Um, it's, it, it doesn't have a lot of features, but that blue color you may have noticed, that's due to some methane in the atmosphere, which um, uh, causes us to be able to see that, that blue color. Uranus does have rings. And when we look at the rings, you get to see that the planet is totally tipped over. Uh, it may have gotten hit by something in the distant past or it may have tipped the whole planet over um, about 90 degrees. So interesting things going on here. We think maybe that um, there is uh, some carbon material that might be in the atmosphere of Uranus or Neptune. And that carbon material, as it falls inward, gets compressed, higher pressure. It may be raining diamonds on the inside of uh, Uranus and Neptune. But again, speculation based on what we think the composition of these worlds are and the pressures and temperatures that we see, uh, that we think we, uh, we would experience here. Neptune has more storms, uh, stormier atmosphere, higher winds than we see for for uh, than we see for Uranus. You can see some of these dark spots, but unlike on Jupiter, where some of these spots stick around a long time, the spots in Neptune's atmosphere disappear um, rather quickly. And you can see some of these methane clouds in in kind of three D relief in this picture as well. Again, we, we don't know a lot about these two. There's, there's, a, there's a hope that sometime in the next 10 years, NASA will approve a spacecraft to go visit Uranus. Um, and it would, it would get there, uh, if approved, it would get there sometime in about the mid 2040s. It just takes that long for a spacecraft to, to be built and then get out to, um, uh, get out to where Uranus is. So. Fingers crossed that we'll be able to learn more about um, uh, this planet. One of my favorite places is definitely Pluto. Um, it is a world that is covered in craters, but it is also covered in glaciers. Um, and this lighter colored area right here is a glacier. That glacier is made of nitrogen. Uh, nitrogen is a gas here on Earth. Nitrogen is a solid on Pluto. And so this is a nitrogen glacier and these peaks right here are water ice mountains floating on top of the nitrogen ice glacier. And I just love this picture because you can see the glaciers, you can see the mountains, you can see Pluto's very thin atmosphere. Pluto's atmosphere is about a thousand times thinner than Mars's atmosphere. Mars's atmosphere is about a hundred times thinner than Earth's atmosphere. So um, it's a very, very thin atmosphere, but it does have one. <coughs> but it is a cold, icy world with, uh, with, again, a lot of craters and flowing ice. This is Pluto's largest moon, Charon. Um, it's about half the size of Pluto, um, but looks quite a bit different. Uh, but one of the most amazing things to, to think about is the reason I'm showing you this world is a lot of the material that you're looking at is not rock. This looks like rock, but what you're seeing is a lot of ice. Um, Karen is covered in a lot of water ice, ice on the surface and ice below the surface. Um, so it's, it's a really amazing place. There are a lot of worlds out past Uranus and Neptune, um, and Pluto, Eris, Haumea, Makamaka, and, and several others. And these are just a few of the worlds that are out, uh, farther beyond in, in our solar system. And they're all to relatively true color and true brightness to each other. Eris, is of a similar size as Pluto. Eris is a little brighter, a little more reflective. Haumea, this one right here, spins so quickly. I think it's, it spins once every four hours that it spun itself into an egg shape, kind of flattened at the poles. It also has a ring 
and it has at least two moons. Um, so this is a really interesting place that we'd love to, to know more about. But many of these worlds out in our outer solar system have moons as well. So um, they, they may be small, but they are definitely interesting. So we would like to learn more about them. Pluto and Eris are the largest of, uh, so far, the largest of these worlds that are out past Neptune. Finally, comets. So you've got asteroids are leftovers from the formation of our solar system, mostly made of rock and metal, and some of them have some ice. Comets are mostly made of ice with a little bit of rock mixed in. So think of them as uh, uh, on a number line. You've got, you've got asteroids at one end, comets at the other, and you can have a continuum of stuff with more rock, less rock, more ice, less ice. And so these are some of the uh, comets that we've seen up close. You've got Comet Milk 2, which looks like a bowling ball. You've got Comet Borelli, which looks like a bowling pin. And you've got Comet Alley that looks like a potato. Um, Comet Hartley looks like whatever it is Comet Hartley looks like. And we've got Comet 67P, um, which is this one right here, which you've got some spectacular close-up images uh, from the Rosetta spacecraft um, from a few years ago. And uh, they're leftovers from the formation of our solar system, but because comets were from farther out in the solar system where it was a lot colder, that's where you get uh, a lot more ice. Where you've got asteroids, they formed in a location that was warmer and that's why you got more rock. So anyway, that gives you a sense of our solar system. You've got our first four planets from the sun where it was warmer, rockier. Farther out from the sun, you've got Jupiter and Saturn, the gas giants where it was colder and you could collect more stuff. You've got Uranus and Neptune, which are ice giants. So you've got uh, icy, even colder places in our solar system. And then farther out, we've got uh, Pluto and everything else. And then the, the uh, icy leftovers called the comets. So, whoops. Hang on, I just wanted, there we go. I think I stopped sharing, there we go. So we had quite a trip through the solar system. Do we have questions that we'd like to get to? Hello, uh, Michelle, that was so cool. What, Thanks. Uh, what amazing photographs you shared with us tonight. And I learned a lot and I bet our audience did too. And I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we do have a couple questions from our right. audience tonight. Bring them on. Um, the first one is, so now that Mars has frozen over, is it no longer the red planet or is it the desert dust that makes it kind of red? Yeah, it is the dust that makes it red. It's the, um, the red is not due to temperature. The red is due to um, an iron uh, containing mineral called hematite. And when you, um, when, you, when you grind hematite down, when it, when it uh, gets eroded down, it gets eroded into this uh, reddish colored dust. So it might start off as a grayish colored rock, but as it gets ground down more and more and more, um, you see this reddish colored rock. And so, um, so that dust is, is red because of the iron containing mineral. So, so yeah, definitely red. Um, think of it more like rusty red um, than, uh, than, than temperature heat uh, or anything like that. So. All right, great. Um, second question, how fast does Jupiter spin in comparison to Earth? So Jupiter, just to give us a sense of, of size, you could fit almost a thousand Earths inside Jupiter. If you, if you hollowed out Jupiter and put in Earth marbles, you could fit in a thousand, almost a thousand Earth marbles. Jupiter is 11 Earths wide. It's a big planet. We spin once every 23 hours, 56 minutes, 24 hours. Jupiter spins in just under 10 Earth hours. So giant planet 11 Earths wide spins really fast for, for something that big. Um, it, it, it spins remarkably fast. And actually Saturn spins only slightly slower. 
Um, so yeah, big planets are spinning really quickly. That was the next question is how fast does sp Saturn spin? And you said you already also, have yep, uh, just under 10 hours for, for both of those. Uh, Jupiter is slightly, slightly faster. I don't remember what the number is off the top of my head, but, but it's, it's close to 10 Earth hours. So okay. yeah, so it is, it is 752 right now. Mm -hmm. So basically 10 hours from now, Jupiter will have spun once. Oh, that's so, a good way. Now we so, can put it in perspective that way. Yeah, but, yeah so about six o'clock tomorrow morning. All right. Jupiter will have spun once. Okay. Uh, next question, Michelle. Is, <coughs> what are Saturn's rings made of? Mostly water ice. So uh, some of those water ice pieces are as small as a grain of sand. Some of them are as big as a house. And um, so you've got different sizes of those water ice bits and um, uh, different different densities of them in the rings. But basically we, we think something really icy got too close to Saturn and Saturn's gravity might have pulled it apart. And we just happen to be living in a period of time in our solar system where these rings are, are dense enough and bright enough that we can see them easily in our small telescopes. So Saturn may not always have had uh, a ring system like this. Um, we just happen to be living in the night and the cool time in our solar system where we can see it. All right. Well, headed down the line, we got a couple more questions for you. How big is Cirrus compared to other ex ex asteroids, asteroids. Um, yep. bodies like our moon? Yep. Yep. So I'm looking it up. I believe I want to make sure I give you the right uh, diameter. Um, I believe it's about 600 miles in diameter. Let me check. It is, yes, yeah. So Ceres is about 600 miles in diameter and that's the largest asteroid. And so the rest of them are smaller than that. Um, Itakawa, that barely held together rubble pile that I showed you, that one is about a quarter mile in length-ish. You could put Itakawa on the museum campus. One end of it would be at the Adler, the other end of it would be at the Field Museum. Wow. So yeah, yeah. So we got big range of distance, uh, uh, um, big range of sizes of asteroids in the solar system. Okay. Uh, Tenley also asks, are any spacecrafts able to take photos with color? So all, I think all, I'm pretty sure all spacecraft take images in black and white. What they do is they'll put different filters on the black and white, over the black and white camera, essentially. And so maybe they'll gather a certain type of red light and a certain type of green light, a certain type of blue light. Um, we can then put those together when those images come back to Earth, we can put those together and um, uh, add the color to give us a, a true color picture. So a lot of those images that you see of the planets and all that, the original image was probably uh, some form of gray. And then post-processing here on Earth, they'll, they'll add the color based on however much light came through that filter. So what you're seeing is real. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely no less real than, than what your eyes can see. Um, it's just that uh, science cameras are, tend to take pictures using particular wavelengths of light because we want to, we get information from that. Um, there are cameras on the um, Curiosity rover, the Perseverance rover, those, those are color cameras. Um, so all the cameras on Perseverance, for example, are color. But the, the spacecraft imagery, again, everything that you saw today was, was a real picture. Nothing was, um, uh, nothing was uh, an artist's rendition. So, uh, except for those those model those those to size scale images that I showed you at the at the beginning. Sure. Um, um, so okay. Yeah. Well, uh, Angel has a fun question for us. Uh, who names moons, asteroids, comets, etc.? Is it simply whoever first spots and documents them? Not quite. Um, so 
long-standing convention for astronomy is if you discover a comet, it's named for you. The one exception is Halley's Comet. Halley's Comet was not discovered by Edmund Halley. Edmund Halley figured out that comets, that that particular comet orbited the sun and he predicted um, a bit about it, about its orbit and when it would return to be seen on earth again. So that, that's the exception. Halley's Comet was not discovered by him. Um, but it's named for him because it's it's important. It, it, he he was important in the in the history of that comet. Um, <clears throat> asteroids. If you discover an asteroid, you get to name it, but you can't name it after yourself. <laughs> I don't know why. It just it just is the convention. Um, everything else in the solar system is named by the International Astronomical Union. It's a group of astronomers who periodically get together and maybe we'll have some new uh, photographs of features on Mars and maybe they'll decide, okay, we need to name some of this stuff. And so they may ask the general public for names. They may come up with names in a committee, um, but they'll select names from, uh, from, from a, a group and then decide what the names are. So for example, um, Names on Venus are named after women. Names of um, features on the moon on the near side are named for scientists and philosophers. Names on the far side of the moon are named for Russian scientists and philosophers because Russia was the first country to be able to photograph the far side of the moon. Mm. It's just, again, it's just the, just the convention. Um, names of Moons of Uranus are named for characters in Shakespeare's plays because that, somebody started doing that and they just kept on doing it. So fascinating stuff. Wow. So if we have grand illusions <laughs> of naming something after ourselves, it's not going to happen. Probably not going to happen unless you discover no. a comet. Unless a comet. Okay. So yep. everybody look for a comet, then they can. There you go. <laughs> um, let's see if we have any more. <laughs> Is the, I don't, O O R T cloud, Oort cloud, Oort. Really, mm -hmm. really part of our solar system, or is it the start of a different space? So, what the Oort cloud is, it, it, it's named for Jan Oort, who was um, an astronomer. I don't know if he's still alive. I don't know that for certain. Anyway, um, he postulated that there was a distant uh, orbiting sphere, I guess you could say, of comets. Uh, even farther out than Pluto and all those worlds and everything. So we have three belts or zones of stuff in, in our solar system. You've got, well, actually several. You've got the first four planets, the rocky planets. You've got the asteroid belt. You've got the gas giants and the ice giants. You've got the, um, the objects out past Neptune and out in that direction, you've got another band of comets and asteroids and stuff called the Kuiper Belt. And the Oort cloud is even farther out, but that is, the, that is a, a cloud or a sphere or a region of um, comets that would be uh, still gravitationally bound to our sun. So they, they are part of our solar system, yes. Got it. Okay. And then I have um, a, a question for you, Michelle. When will the next solar eclipses be? Ah, so the next solar eclipses will be visible in this area. Um, October, excuse me, I have to cough. <coughs> October 14th, 2023. It's a Saturday. And then Monday, April 8th, 2024. So from our area in October, 2023, the sun will be about 40-ish percent covered by the moon. On, on April 8th, 2024, in our area, the sun will be 94% covered by the moon. If you remember all the excitement from 2017, we get to do that all over again. So get ready. Yay. Um, That's yes. great fun. Exactly. I hope they'll come back and see us maybe in person at the library. That'd be super cool. I would love that. I'm in Aurora. I'm just, I'm just down, uh, essentially just down Route 31. I could, I could be up there pretty easily. 
right in the hood. All right. Well, we'd yep. love to have you back. And um, thank you. We want to thank you so much. We, we have some other comments in the chat just thanking you for this wonderful program. And it's been really, really interesting and, uh, and, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for all your wonderful questions and your attention. Really appreciated it. Um, thanks for having me. Hope to see you again soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Please.